Yeah. Let's get started. And you can worry about your download all you got all <laughs> fifteen minutes, right? Uh, So more, more Kayla. I know, right? Oh, yeah, the query is so much fun. <laughs> um, so Kayla has a bunch of collections. Um, it gets a little interesting because they're also compatible with Java collection. Um, they also divide them into mutable and immutable collections. Um, you just be careful because if you get a mutable collection, you can't change it. Two common ones are array and array buffer, array builder. Arrays um, are basically um, fixed size when you create them so they don't grow. And if you want to actually so sort of pen things like you do in Java arrays, you need the array buffer. Um, and there's you know, by now you should be all old news, right? Um, all the active elements, well it's not ankle brackets, it's you know glue brackets. Um, various ways of creating arrays. They combine arrays and larger arrays. Array buffers have all the same operations, except you can also pin, right? So you can add things to the end. Um, they'll grow for you the same way an array in, in Java doesn't grow. But the main reason you want to talk about collections is because they come with entire order functions, map, reduce, filter. Right. Some of you have seen these before. These are the building blocks that you use in a do and spark. Okay. For loops don't exist there. Right? In that in that world you don't say for i equals zero to n. No, no, no. You use map to produce and filter and prior order function. So map is just you take all the elements of the collection and you transform each one and you get a new collection with a transformed element. That's it. Right? Filter, well, you just select which elements of that collection you want. Um, reduce, it combines all the elements into one thing. Right? So here's some examples of map. Um, I create an array. I create a Increment function, and then I can apply an increment to all the elements of that collection by using that. Right. So I get back um, all the elements are able to increment by one. Right. Um, second example, uh, I'm adding ten to all the elements. Right. Third example, I'm raising all the elements to squaring them, right? And again, the syntax is I have to pass in a function, right? Map, <coughs> and I'm passing an anonymous disclosure, and the underscore is an argument, right? And fan, power, here I'm being fully really more explicit. Um, I'm taking it a function of input of x, and I multiply x by two and subtracting three, and I apply that to all the operations. And 
right? Another one, another function. Right. So in assignment one, I haven't graded yet, but I looked at a third of them. And the first two problems, everyone used four loops, except for two out of the twenty. They don't exist in, in the, the new for smart world either. Right. For loop, while loop, all those, they don't work. Right? They don't exist. So you have to be able to train yourself to solve problems using map and reduce and filter. Right? Right, so. You know, if I want to. Add can to all elements in the array. What do I do? Well, I can add this for loop, right? And I go through all the elements and I add can to it and I then I add it to the array buffer. Now, to be clever, you can, I don't have to do indexing, I can just go through the elements myself in the for loop. Um, So that's how we could do it with math, right? So it's, it's less typing, right? We, we're not typing as much. And that's always a good thing, right? I mean, aren't programmers a little lazy and won't type less? Um, but it's also, there's less detail you're worrying about, right? How many people here have written a for loop or a while loop, right, and gotten the start endpoint wrong? Happens all the time, right? Um, doing math, you don't deal with the, those details are hidden from you, right? So there's less boilerplate code you have to deal with. Why do you have to spend all your time for int i equals zero, i plus plus, semicolon, i less than a dot length, right? How many times have you repeated that? It's only a couple then. You don't write many programs, right? You know, with these high order functions, math and reduce, you don't get to worry about that, right? Now that, if you do a functional programming, right, these are the reasons I give, right? But for this course, as important <coughs> is the last one, right? So the math function, the filter function, the reduce function, can be optimized for you to different types of things, right? It can, un, it can unroll loops, it can do very standard optimization, it can rearrange operations to make them more efficient. It can say, oh, I'm going to divide this, this computation, this, this math, instead of doing it on one machine, that's going to be done on ten machines, right? And you don't have to worry about which part of the data is a machine one, which part of the machine two, because you're not going for i equals one to n, right? You're just saying math, right? And so the library can deal with that for you, right? So let's look at some details, right? So you want to compute the sum of a, a bunch of a bunch of data, right? So normally, what do you do? You take the first element, you have the second element, right? And you take that sum, you add the third element. You're not doing that. So you add the first two elements together. And then you take that result, and that's, right? You do this, you keep on doing this. This is a normal progression how you've done this a million times, right? We could do it this way, right? We could do a, pair, a pairwise sum, right? We, we sum up the pairs, and then we sum those pairs up, and we keep on doing that, right? You get the same result. Actually, no, we don't get the same result, right? We only get the same result if they're integers, right? What happens if they're float numbers? What happens if the very first number is big and all the rest are small? Oh, if the one is big enough and the number is small enough, 
the big number swaps the small number, right? And then if I add the first number, and small, I get the first number back again, and another small number to it, I get the first number back again, right? So if all these are small, and I do it the normal way, I only get that one big number. But if I do it pairwise, these numbers start getting bigger and bigger, and when you add them to that first big number, it will actually do something. It will go from the sum. So we get a more accurate result. <coughs> In fact, right, if you do a normal sum, the air growth rate it is order n times epsilon, or epsilon is the division of your machine, right? And n is the number of floats you want to add. Pairwise sum goes by, right, the logarithm there, it goes slower. So the air rate is slower if you do pairwise sum. If you're doing a for loop, you're going to just go all the way through. If you're using map, right, um, and these functions now, they can be optimized for us, right? So now, in Python, they've got this numerical library called NumPy. Some of you probably know about or use it, right? When you do a sum in NumPy, it does pairwise summation. Why? Because it is just as fast and there's less air. Right? If you lose null angle rate, when you compute a sum of a collection, it does pairwise for you. Right? So when Julia looks like this, well, here's a linear sum. Um, and then I did some, I did some calculations where you, you take the sum um, that takes, which took Point zero zero eight seconds to sum up um, point one ten million times. Doing it linearly like you normally do the for loop, there is a much greater error, right? <coughs> that sum should be not nine 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 nine, right? When I add point one ten million times, I should not there shouldn't be any nines there, right? So not only is it faster, you get better less error. You can use reduce to the same thing, same result, same time. And there's actually even a better way of adding up numbers, right, of the con sum, and it actually is more accurate for all this error. I tried it in Scala, so I did it for loop, like using their sum and using the reduce. Um, so what do we get? You can do sum. Well, I get the same result. Um, the loop is a lot faster, reduced, a little slower. Um, so again, I'm getting the same here, right? All right. So the so then your sum doing the loop in Julia you get the same error you get in all three places in, in um, Scala. The difference is Scala is a general purpose programming language and they don't worry about numerical calculations. Julia and Pynum are created to do numerical computations, right? They're created for People who do these computations all the time, and so they worry about that. And so they're, they're reduced and their sum, right, are optimized by doing pairwise sum. So far, so good. Why doesn't Scala do it? What? Is it John for language? And so then. You know, that wasn't their focus, right? Um, they also have a feature called PAR. Um, so when you do 
power operation and <coughs> collection. Right, so they'll do in parallel. Um, so here I have a simple expression, and you see that the numbers don't come out in order because it's separating the parallel threads and actually executing in parallel. Um, so now what we can do is you know, if I have a a collection, I can then call par on it. And then I can start doing filter and the juice or map. Um, here I'm, give me all the even elements and then sum them up. And now I can do it in parallel. Right? So I if you're doing four i equals one, right? This becomes really hard to do, right? When you do a for loop like that, it becomes a, comp a compiler has to do it, right? Or you have to do it by hand. When it becomes part of filter or map or reduce, it's a library call, and that can be optimized, right? And the key thing here is, this is what they use in Hadoop and Spark to do the computation on a cluster, so you don't have to do all the hard work of saying, oh, map this over there, map this over here, and then take this thing and map change over here, right? So all your problems, your toolkit just becomes map, and reduce, and filter, and sum, and the entire order sum. That's why assignment two is like the first two problems are the same, but no, no, no while loop, no for loop. You have to right, use to solving these problems right, using the higher order construct. <coughs> Question. So the question is, you know, what's good about the higher order function? Um, I would say several things, right? The first thing is, it's just less work. Yes. Right? Second thing is, it reduces, and it reduces the boilerplate the intent of what you're trying to do is more obvious, right? I mean, when I look here, there's only three short lines. So what am I doing? Well, the filter is, is it even, right? And then I'm getting the sum. So it becomes much easier to see the intent of the code. Still on the back end, it's that, like, you don't have to like this, this is going to be more fleshed out when we start using the US and the actual computing. When we do the cluster computing, it's like there's no for loops, right? Yeah. It's okay. all map, it's all reduced, right? In fact, if you do Hadoop, there's only two operations to do map and reduce, period. So all your problems have to be solved is with map and reduce. <coughs> That's all you got. Now you can repeat them over and over again, but it's math and the group. And you can math again and reduce again. And so for us, yes, the primary reason for using higher function is because that key thing that they use to make it easy to use these cluster machines and solve problems. Now, one of the reasons why functional programming is starting to become more popular is because these high order functions make life easier. Right? So that's why they're played, the plate, the technical calls become more obvious. Right? So the filter, all the filter does is um, it returns all the elements in the collection that make that function function return true, right? 
greater than three, then the all elements greater than three. Not greater than three, all elements which are three or less, right? Um, even, not even, um, is it a vowel? You know, delta there is vowel, right? You get all the vowels in that string. Again, it's just um, what does reduce do? Well, um, reduce takes the first two elements of question and applies it to that function. And then take the result, right, and then take the third element and Although it can, right, different, like in Julia binomes, when you do reduce, it's, it will not necessarily going to do it from left to right. So find the sum, finding, right, find the min. Um, so that's become the toolkit. Like I said, in Hadoop, it's either you got math and you got to do. Um, Gale has more like a partition, like a partition data and group, right? Um, group I current condition. Um, and yeah, there's other higher order functions. <coughs> Max, min, count. Right. Hell, some right. So there's a bunch of these operations. Once once you get used to them, right, your code shrinks. You're not doing it all these orders. Right. So it's these types of things that we can we can use. Um, So when you get map and reduce, right, filter and take while and count and max and min and take and take right, etc. They cover a lot of the times where you'd want to use a while loop for four loop. Mm -hmm. What's that? <coughs> result is result twenty, yes. Why is take while greater than two? So what does take while do? You take all the elements while that condition is true, right? As soon as that condition is false, you're done. And so why is result 20 empty array? Well, because the first element is one, and that's left not greater than two, and so it gets false, and so we're done. Right. So the bunch of operations um, now I have to tell you, you know, I've taught functional programming a couple times, and the hardest part for the student was stopping your fingers 
I'm typing four parentheses i equals zero, right? And literally, they just, you give them a problem, they're like, how do I solve it? I'm like, what do you mean how you solve it? And you've got maps and reduce and filter, and they would put, I want a for loop, where's my for loop? And they're like, no, 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 no. And, and literally, it, that was the hardest part, right? They're usually being a list language, escape, I mean, closure, and there's all these funny parentheses. That was not the hard part. The hard part was, where's my for loop, right? They couldn't solve problems with the for loop, and it took them like a month to get over the fact that there was no for loop. Um, and last year when I taught this course, there's a student who I said, okay, Simon, no for, can't use for loop. He went ballistic. He's like, oh, that is stupid. I'm like, what are you, some idiot? Right? And he went out of his way to try and irritate me. He's like, sorry, dude, but um, if you want to use a Duke or Spark, you don't have a you don't have a while loop. You don't have a for loop. It doesn't work, right? Because they want some easy way to shred, to put this computation up on my cluster. And then once you've got like higher functions, you start chaining them together. And that's typically what happens in Spark. Is like okay, I'm going to do a map and reduce, and then do another map. And then maybe I'll do a sum and then I just change the operation together. And instead of, instead of being done on a single process and a single thread, what's going to happen is, oh, you've got this, you've got this 10, you know, 10 gigabyte file. I can put in a file system and I can tell it to run on 10 machines and it's going to automatically distribute, break that file into 10 pieces, ship it out for us. And when I run this map, right, it's going to run on those 10 machines on the part of the data that's there. And then when it's done, it's going to grab all the results of that data and bring it back to the main machine and do the computation on, the, on that data and bind them together. Right, so we do the math, so we, you know, we're getting more results. Now the other thing, which Scala doesn't do particularly well by itself, um, you could say, look, what's happening here is you know, my data is a million elements. I then do a map on it. I go through everything, right? And then I map the filter again, right? And then I go through all the elements again the third time, right? And if there's a million or ten million or hundred million elements, it's very inefficient. Most functional languages do what they call lazy evaluation, and so they they make one pass of the data. First, do the map on the two elements and pass results to the next thing in the chain. And that's what Spark does, right? Spark is lazy evaluation. Um, the, the problem here is that when I evaluate this function, I'm doing meta to meta much time, and I'm doing all the filter, right? Um, so I'm going through the data multiple times. Do it lazily and scale up. We have to say view, and then we can do it. Um, and then what happens is we don't get map and a map, and that's what we filter. We get map and then a filter, then a map and filter. Right? So what's happening is we're basically someone's going to pull things through. Someone's going. I need. I, I need a value. So it asks the filter, give me. Give me a couple of elements. And the filter says, oh, but I need some elements to map, right? So we, we pull it through. And so first, I'm going to get two elements to map, and then I have the filter. And, but now I need another one for map again, so I can, right? So I'm not, I'm only making one pass through my data. So it's not, when I have these chains, I'm not going through data multiple times, right? Question. So, evaluation is your friend. Right. It allows us to chain all these things together and not make multiple passes through the data. 
And so, of course, far um, will do these chaining operations, and you know, you've got terabytes of data, right? Um, you're not making multiple passes to the data. You're going to like, oh, I'm going to make one pass to the data and apply these operations. So in essence, you can, the operations are being rearranged for us in the background. Right, so the view returns a collection that's evaluated later. Um, I could have, well, sum is going to reduce one number, right? So it doesn't make sense to do like sort after sum. So I could do a math and then I could do a filter and I could do a, I could do a sort, right? So when you sort elements, how do you get your sort? You get your sort by So the key thing you remember here is that in Spark, these operations are all done later. Any other questions? It is back, yeah. Let's see, yeah, this one next. So some, some things about classes. Not so important for Spark, but they do some interesting things, right? So I can create a class. Seems like it's pretty similar to Java class. So I give it you know, a couple uh, fields, and then in find cool methods, overwrite two strings, right? And then I can like create a new fraction, the normal constructor. I don't need these, and then I can start doing standard Java. Class. Right. What's that? Is there a constant and variable on scala? Let's see there's bar and bell, right? What is a bell? And Kayla has the bar, right? What's the bar? There's a bar. Yes. Now, what does bell mean? <coughs> what kind of value? Can that value change? Right, so if I want a constant, I, I declare it to be a val, and my, I find a value and we're done, right? So yes, David does have... Um, they've got, you know, private, protected, and public. Right. In Java, object is a, is a top class, right? And Scala is any. And it's pretty similar to Java's object, right? It contains basic operations of 
pairing and is equal to and two strings. What they call class parameters. When I create, a, when I define a class, I can give it a parameter list. Those parameters all become fields in the class. So I don't have to redeclare them. And I can also access them. And here, well, A is a bar, so I can change. B is a val, so it can't change. It's constant by constant. It's C plus plus. Um, so I, any way to try and change it? Um, and then C becomes privacy. So I don't give it a val or a bar. Um, this is sort of fun because now I have uh, who has a bar x, so I can access x. Um, I'm defining a to be basically a property is equal to x, right? And B um, is a setter, right? So I can access the value of A by test.A. I can access the value of B by test.B. Um, so since I gave the parentheses after, I can also do up, I can do it without rule with the parentheses. Um, but A, um, I can't, because I can find, as I said, no right. Getters and setters are generated differently in in Scale and Adu and Java. If you want to explicitly have getters and setters, it's not get and set x or right, whatever variable name is. If you're defining getters and setters for property A. So the getter is just set the value of the property type and then I'm defining what value you should have. Right? Often when you want to have getters and setters, you'll have a private field and then you'll um, expose it using the setter and getter. And the value of x. Um, and then the setter is right, it's the name of the property underscore. And then you have to give it a function that is called to assign the value when it's called, right? So when I create a new foo, I can say test.x equals the value, uh, and that's assigning the value x to x public uh, field. Um, but A, right, the property, when I find a value to it, what we're doing is it's calling the setter method, setting the value of x equal to that value, right? So when I say A equals 2, that happens as x becomes 2 because A is just a setter method which changes the value of x. Again, usually in scale, you do this, you make x private. I did to see the value. Um, and so every time I find a the value, I'm calling that setter, and every time I ask the value of a, I'm calling that getter. And so the, the property a becomes the getter and setter for the field of x. Question? Um, so typically, you know, if you want to do this, you you make the the actual field private, and then provide access to it via the getters and set. You can do one or the other, but not 
no need to alter them. Um, constructors. Um, there's a primary constructor, right? Which is and I define a fraction here, right? The primary constructor is declared by class, right? Two parameters and D. Um, auxiliary constructors are defined by this. The function is multiple this, this is. And when I call this x comma one, that's called an alignment. Syntax is really different, right? Than Java, Preston. I want to get you some. Weird stuff. And we can, like C, we can find operators on our classes and use them. We can't do a Java, right? So here, um, defining the multiplication operator on a fraction and define it for both how to multiply a fraction by an integer and how to multiply a fraction by a fraction. Right? And then in C, we can do this Java. <coughs> Here's an example of using them, right? I create a fraction and a multiple by two. I can take two fractions, multiple them together, and call that up. Nothing earth shattering yet. Uh, well, why is that compiled? Okay. I'm not changing half, right? Yeah, if we go back to where I was going before, right? I was multiplying half times two, right? How did we find the operator? We defined the operator as defined in the fraction class, right? As taking the argument of an inch, right? Well, here that I'm calling that plus operator on that object, right? I'm passing in an inch. When I do it this way, I'm calling a plus operator on the two, which is an integer, and it doesn't know how to multiply itself by a fraction. Clear? Yeah, if we if x so it's solid. Well, this is you know basically you know we think of that as an operator, right? But it's really a function, two arguments, right? And the first argument is a fraction. The second argument is an integer. 
there, this first argument is a integer, and the second argument is a fraction. Alright, so it says, I can't do that. And here is where the fun begins. Um, we have what they, they have what they call implicit conversion. So I'm defining a conversion, implicit defined into fraction, and if R takes the input as an integer, and it then returns a fraction. Right? And it's, the implicit is important there, and depth is important there, right? So I'm saying, and the naming is important, right? So now, when I, I can now say val test is a fraction is sign equal to 2. What happens is the compiler then is going to say, look, oh, that's a fraction, that's an integer. Do I have a way of converting integers to fractions? Oh, yes, I do. So it's going to apply this implicit conversion to it and call that new fraction and pass in, right, x. And now when I say 2 times half, right, the is going to say, wait a minute, um, how do I multiply an integer times a half fraction? I don't know how to do that. Is there a way for me to convert an integer to something that I can convert to multiple by a fraction? Or is there a way for me to convert the fraction to something that I can convert to an integer? And I'll find this implicit um, conversion. Oh, I'll convert that integer to a fraction. And I know I multiply a fraction by a fraction because it's buying a fraction by fraction. So the question is, if you look at the first case, right? Um, it's clear what the compiler has to do is pretty clear, right? Because I declare it has to be a fraction. And I'm assigning it to an integer, so it's clear that the compiler say, well, is there a way of changing an int to a fraction, right? Um, it's a bit more complicated to deal with two times a fraction, right? For one, I didn't declare what one, I'm, I'm using type inference so the compiler has to figure out what should one be, right? And to figure out what one hit be, you have to figure out what that's going to be. Now to figure out what this is going to be, you have to figure out how, what, what plus operator can I apply, right? And so it's looking for a plus operator that can apply, or a multiplication operator that can apply to an int and a fraction. So there's only a few places to look, right? One is then you go to the integer class and say what operations do you have there? And there's nothing, there's no, into times fraction. And then it goes to the fraction in class and says, well, is there a way of, no, there's no way of doing that, right? So then it has to look, what can I get, can I convert one to something that works, right? And so, it knows how to convert it into a fraction, so can that, well, can I convert that into a fraction, and then do I have something called fraction times fraction? The answer is yes. Now, if I convert something, if I now had an implicit conversion to convert a fraction to an int, oh, now we get fun times, right? Because which one is the father going to choose? Is it, is it, will it convert the int to a fraction and do that, or will it convert the fraction to an int? And then do int times int. Right? 
And typically in those situations, the compiler will say, sorry. I mean, you've got two, I've got two ways of solving this problem. Which one am I going to use? Yeah, I haven't tried it, but I assume that if you had an implicit conversion from subtraction to integer and then tried it, you get a compiler of saying, you have to tell me what you want, right? And then you're going to have to explicitly tell the compiler what type one is going to be, a fraction or an int. And once you do, then I can figure out which one is going to convert to one. What's that? Well, what's happening here is I'm recording test to get a fact fraction, right? And that's what that means is we, we get so used to the, the type inference, right? We forget that all variables, all valves and bars have to have a type. Right. Here, the file is adding it. Here, that's more. Here, I'm going to put So, this test is a type fraction. Right. And the sign equals an integer. Why is it like, look, you know, it's a different thing. So, when that happens, it says, is, is there a way for me to convert that integer into a fraction? And I say, oh, yes, yeah, so I've got this entry fraction. Conversion. So you know, and call this function convert that to the fraction. Okay. Any other question? So there's a require which basically says this has to be true. Right? Um, so here I'm saying I'm going to fraction, but I'm requiring that the denominator is not zero because right divided by zero is undefined. Um, and so it's a A version of giving contracts to classes and here the conditions have to be true for this to work. Um, and if you're coming from C or Java or C sharp, right, you've got these static fields and static methods, and they do a non existence table. Right? No static field, no static method. They were the called singleton object. So if I declare, here I'm declaring just one to be an object. It's basically equivalent to all the static field methods of which class in Java. Um, I can define properties, fields, methods, all I want. And the only way to access those fields and methods is you know, just one dot the name of the method or name of the field. <coughs> they what they call companion objects. So often they'll create a class and often the same name. So here it's um, fraction of the class. Now I create object of fraction. And I'm declaring basically um, two functions, zero and unity. And now I can 
I can pretend we're in Java land where I have static fields, right, on a class, and I can call it fraction dot zero, or I can then create a fraction object and start doing things, right? And then finally, there is um, you know, typically, I mean, some way to start the whole thing off, right? So in, in Java, you create a class and you have a static void main. And in Scala, you create an object and you have then a main method. And then you call that to start the whole thing. And then you can do all the work it to do in main. Um, and typically, when you load the object in the memory, executes all the code inside of it. So um, when I call foo.main here, it's going to Print out before main and then after main, and then it's going to call the function. It's loading the two objects in memory and it's supposed to and finds all the code on that level. Okay, um, traits. This is something new. If you come from Java land, Traits are pretty old. In Java, you've got interfaces. Interfaces is defined. Um, you define what methods should exist. In traits, you can actually implement the methods. Right? And so you can actually implement things by right? defining cells and find bars. I can define methods. In my trait, and then I can add it to classes, right? And those classes then get those methods. It's not something we're, we need to work. We're going to deal with some sparks, but this is something that in the object drawing world is going to be. You know, a number of people pushing for traits as opposed to inheritance. It causes less problems and gives you more functionality. So it's magic. We always need magic, right? Um, well, there is this application thing which is sort of the main object, but I can Use the print line. Um, where does the print line come from? Like that? Java does not have a print line. Java does not have function. Right? Or prior to Java 8, there was no, no function. Right? Where does that function come from? Well, it turns out that there's an object called pre-def, and that object contains a bunch of functions, um, and it's imported to all scale of files automatically, implicitly, and so all those functions are fine in pre-def um, you have access to. So if you don't know this, you don't. There's all these weird things that happen, like where does the print line come from? I mean, is it just everywhere? Yes, it does, but only because it's in pre -death. And so if you become a scalar programmer, you really want to look at um, pre -death to see what's in there. Because so that's what's available. Both functions are available um, everywhere. This is fun. Um, the goal here is I want to be able to 
use that connection point to mean compute the factorial of that energy. Right? How do we do that? Um, now, one problem is 10 factorial is awfully big. So it may not fit into, right? At some point, factorial doesn't fit into integer. Um, so we really want to pick in. And so, to find factorial, Now, first of all, factorial defined weirdly, right? What, so inside factorial of big int, I'm defining another factorial function which has two arguments. One is n and one is accumulator, which is, I use the accumulator to go. Um, and I basically do it recursively, right? I, Multiply n times accumulator and subtract n by 1. And then I'm going to base case when n is less than 1, I stop and turn accumulator. And then when I call the factorial, I call my inner factorial with n and accumulator 1. Right? Yeah, it still doesn't get me to this 10 exclamation point, right? Well, then I can declare um, a, a factorial class, and it's got one operator, the exclamation point, and what does it do? Um, it calls factorial of n, right? That still doesn't get me to the vein, right? Why? Because who, who is the receiver of the bank? It's an integer, right? Now I use my implicit definition, I am, right? To implicitly transform an integer into a factorial. Now what can happen is the composite of the doesn't say, Well, first I have to figure out who implements that exclamation point, right? Well, is it defined in the integer class? No, it's not. So, so look there. Oh, but there, there it's defined in the factorial class, but uh, n's not integer, not not a factorial object. Um, there's a way to convert an a integer into a factorial object. Well, there is. Here it is, and so I can. I can convert the integer to a factorial object. Now the factorial object has the exclamation point on it. And I can call that, and that, and that calls my factorial function. Sort of neat, right? Um, I mean, any questions about that? Might work. This is partly why some people really like Scala. It's also why some people really hate Scala. Where in the doing it that way, making an array that goes from range one to n and then after two multiply? The question is, you know, why not just, you know, do map, you know, use reduce. I'm on the range, right? Um, no, no, the, it's, you know, part of manuscript, but it also, um, it's more expressive, right? It says, what do you want? This is a, a common mathematical expression, right? Same reason why we create functions, right? We may create a function that give it a good name so it becomes clear what we're going to do rather than doing that operation in place.
Now the reason some people like scalar bliss is if you could do this, right? And it becomes more stressful. The reason why some people hate it for this reason is because when you get a number of implicit conversions, right, you'll get to the point where like, how does this work? I don't know how to, how is this possible, possible, right? Because you're doing two or three different conversions and all of a sudden something happens, like, I have no idea why it works, right? And that's scary, right? When you have no idea why something's working, you don't know the path it's taking to get there, that's scary, but you don't know if the path it should be to take. Any other questions? This one, oh, I'll, this one's sort of neat, right? Um, so I'm defining repeat while, and it has, oh, it's a curried function, right? Because there's argument and argument. And oh, both arguments are, are functions, right? And what do we do? Well, this while condition, if I evaluate that first function, and then while that function returns true, I then execute the second function, right? And now I can use it. You know, here I'm going to bar x equals zero, repeat while, here's my first function, right? So the x is less than four. And I give the block of code, right? And so what this looks like, it looks like a control structure that's built into the language, right? Because we're used to um, while, wow, and then parenthesis, and then some condition, and then the curly brackets, and then the, the block of code we execute, right? So basically, the second magic trick, you know, we do not create our own sort of control structure. Right? Yeah, we don't, we're not from foreign for us later on. Um, let me go. Yeah, another sort of magic trick. Well, um, I'm creating a class that has an until and a while. And again, doing the same thing, right? There's, um, it still has a function of return, and it, well, it's true, it's going to execute all this path into constructor technique. Um, and now I get to do the same, you know, I, I then define repeat as, oh, so it's a new, Repeat object on the code, right? Now I can start again. I can repeat. Here's my block of code. When this is true, right? Repeat. Fill. So again, we're creating we're using the various tricks of the language to create with which looks like control structure. Yeah. And the reason it's important is because now what we're doing is scale allows us to sort of create the new syntax right, with this other thing. And that allows us to do what they call the main specific languages, right? So scale can be used to sort of create a little language Right, that we can then do computation. Question. Thank <laughs> you.
So, um, how many people have installed Spark on their machine? Time for everyone else to do this. All right. So next week, what I want to do is have one more lecture note on sampling, and then I want to start looking at Spark. So if you have not installed it on your machine, that's your task for this weekend. If you've got a Linux machine or a Mac, it should be straightforward. Um, Windows might be a little more complicated. It's not supposed to be. Now we've got five minutes left. Um, so I want to talk a little about uh, the talk on Tuesday. Um, you know, I don't know if people realize what's going on in the world these days in computing. Um, you know, 300 years ago, there was this industrial revolution where, at least on, in Europe, we went from doing everything by hand to having factories that built things. And that completely transformed life, right? Every aspect of life, right? And it made some people extremely wealthy. It made some people extremely poor. And that wealth allowed all kinds of things. Like, for example, Hakka, this little island in the North Sea, rural India for 400 years, a big, huge populated country. It was the wealth they gained from that industrial revolution, right? We're undergoing the same sort of transformation now, in the middle of it, right? Um, <coughs> in the sense of computers allowing to do things that are not done before, right? It's more than the information age, right? Um, you know, some people talk about the idea that the future is not uniform. It arrives sooner in some places than others. Um, you know, so one example, you know, <laughs> from the talk last time, right, all plumbers have had cell phones, right, and they can now use that in their business. But they really can't do much with it, right? It doesn't add much. Plumbers, before cell phones, they had radios in their truck, so they can always call back to the home base, right? And if they're in your house, they have to always they have to just can I use your phone, right? So the cell phone per se it just replaced the radio in their truck and they didn't have to ask you to use your phone. But it didn't help them that much more, right? So what the company Adam is doing is it gave them the software on the phone that brought them to the current age where they could manage your business, they could manage your contacts. They can manage billing, they can schedule, and they can do routing on their phone, right? And that, like I said, that allowed that one plumber to go from, he could only manage one truck because he had to do all, all the other stuff on paper at home, right? Once he could do it on his cell phone, right, he was able to draw to 16 trucks, right? And this is happening all over the place. Right. This is why companies fear Amazon because they're operating now and the, their future is now, right? A lot of companies that they're competing against are operating in 1990, right? And so when Amazon gets to compete with them, they're dead and they know it. And they're, Amazon may not get them for another five or ten years. Those companies, they're operating in the 1990s, right? And how do you compete with someone who's using technology 10, 20, 30 years more advanced? It's very, very hard. Right? So those companies are just going to get fucked aside. And it's software that's doing it. Right? And that's why he talked about changing the world. Right? You wouldn't think that writing software for a cell phone to manage a business is changing the world, but it's magnifying the ability that person what they can do, and the people who don't get on board, right, they're going to be having one truck plumber, but 
guys who can do with 16 trucks and slowly take over the business because they're just that more efficient and can manage more efficiently. And it's happening every place. And there's people who don't get on board or going to end up looking for a good debt. Right. right, and so we're undergoing a huge transformation and it's going to and the software is the center of it. And the people who can write the software right are going to be the ones. Right. So actually, companies like that are going to really change. Right. The economy in the United States is really be transformed. The way you get things done in the future is completely different than they are now. And one of the things they don't really tell you much about the Industrial Revolution is that there was a lot of violence that came about because people were like, our work is starving. Um, what do you do when you're starving and you have no job and no future for jobs? It doesn't matter what you do. So, you know, break into factory and bust it up because, you know, people better starve to death. Didn't do any good though. But, you know, that's what's happening in the world, right? Now. So next time we'll look at sampling and then we'll start looking at the